Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining today's session. Uh, we're going to give everyone just a few minutes to join and we'll get started um, at the top of the hour. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's session. Um, I'm just going to go through a few housekeeping items before I turn it over to Nick and Ryan for our webinar on delivering strategic value in P2P. So everyone will remain on mute for the duration of today's call, um, but don't let that um, shy you away from asking questions. You can pop those questions in the question box on the GoToWebinar control panel, and Ryan and Nick will be sure to answer them at the conclusion of the session. In addition, we'll be, we will be sending everyone um, a recording of the session along with the slides. Um, and as attendees of today's session, you're also going to be getting a report that we, we created in conjunction with the Hackett Group all around delivering strategic value in P2P. So you'll have all of those in your inbox um, shortly after today's webinar session. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to um, Nick and Ryan to introduce themselves. Great. Thanks, Ashley. Um, thank you for putting this together. And, and Nick, thanks for, for joining us on, on the session today. Uh, by means of quick introduction, I am Ryan Enright. You see my title there, uh, Vice President of Business Development uh, for Tungsten Network primarily focused on revenue generation in the Americas region. And I've been with uh, Tungsten in the e-invoicing space for the better part of the last 10 years, which uh, coincidentally enough coincides nicely with the trends that Nick and I will be discussing today as it pertains to a value focus in the P2P space. Uh, Nick, do you wanna say a few words about yourself? Yeah, sure. Thanks, thanks Ryan, thanks, uh, thanks Ashley. Yeah, hi everyone, it's uh, Nick Walden speaking. So I'm based here in uh, London in the UK uh, and I lead our, our program at the Hackett Group for procurement and purchase to pay. So the topic that I'll be uh, talking to you today uh, along with Ryan is very dear to my heart. Um, got some really, really interesting um, trends to share. So uh, Ryan, uh, over to you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so to dive right into it, you know, it seems Nick, like just a short time ago, we were planning for this session with our respective teams and uh, sort of discussing the influx of emails into our inbox from our favorite online retailers about um, COVID preparations and things of that sort. Um, I think it's safe to say that, that now we're in the midst of something that uh, we, we've never seen before and certainly couldn't have uh, prepared for in, in our wildest dreams in some aspects. Um, so. First of all, I think it's important to say that, that we hope for all our attendees out there that you and your, your loved ones are doing well. Uh, we appreciate you joining this session today. Um, hopefully in, in this time of working from home and the upheaval in many of our personal and professional lives, this is a, a good session for you and you'll take away some key learnings. Um, and third, just to, to dive into the agenda, you know, we, we think it's important to talk about some of the experiences 
and perspective we've gained in the past few weeks um, within our own organizations, but certainly with the um, experts in the industries and the customers that we work with on a day-to-day -day basis. So we'll start there with, with that experience in response to COVID-19, and then we'll really get into uh, what was the original intent of the session, uh, which is to focus on um, a real interesting trend in the space around um, focusing on strategic value more than just simply cost savings or efficiency gains. Um, and, and then we'll talk about a kind of a three-stage roadmap um, that Nick has put together for us that, that will really give some good insight into um, the journey that you and your organizations are probably on today and will be for some time. Um, so without further ado, let's talk a little bit, Nick, about uh, where we are in um, in this pandemic, like I said, both on personal and professional levels. Um, I think many in, in our audience are certainly in a place where um, the trends may be still on the uptick rather than um, on a downward cycle. Um, we've seen impacts certainly in, in our business at Tungsten where um, customers have deployed business continuity plans and their supply chain has sort of been thrust into a new way of dealing with things and a, and a new microscope on, uh, on how to handle some of the challenges put in front of us. Um, so I thought it might be good if you could talk about some of the, the insights and, and learnings you and your colleagues have seen over the, the past few weeks. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, thanks, Ryan. I mean, without a doubt, um, the reaction, the response has 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 really been. Um, I mean, as it says here on the on the screen, really, really quite significant, right? Um, some quite profound uh, impacts on the economy, certainly on the financial positions of of companies. You know, most organisations that uh, that I'm working with uh, and in and in constant contact, they say that. You know, pretty much everyone is in work from from home mode today, right? And that means different things for different people. Uh, thankfully, most have had uh, had some sort of plans in place that that seem to to work okay. Uh, and really, it's only that um, that uh, key members of the teams are, are still needing to go into into the office and so on. Um, but yeah, without a doubt, some some real impacts on supply chain continuity. And depending on which uh, industry you're operating in, what what your um, firm does today. You know, you'll, you'll either be um, shutting down to a certain extent, or uh, in in some certain cases, like uh, retail or the pharma or the drug companies, they're well, not retail and food distribution and, and food uh, food production. They're actually ramping up. So some some really interesting things um, that that we've seen, right? So um, you know, our core mission is is really uh, how can we keep our organisations operating in in times like this. And, and even P2P has quite a, a key role to play in terms of enabling, you know, our stakeholders, the business teams, to, to carry out their their core business, uh, make sure that they get the goods and services that they might need to, to carry out uh, their role or their business critical roles, uh, to make sure that uh, you know the vendor invoices are still coming in, um, and according to terms, and, and even for urgent responses, we're able to uh, process and pay. Um, appropriate uh, invoices and get, get those out to uh, to suppliers as as need be. But um, as you were saying, Ryan, right? Uh, unfortunately, it seems we're we're still at the start of this, right? Still early doors um, for for most folks in most countries around the world. Um, I guess there's a couple of exceptions there: China, South Korea, Singapore, and, and thankfully Italy is is coming uh, out of a terrible phase as well. So, uh, yeah. No, I absolutely agree, and, and it is um, especially in, in the space that that we, you know, you and I um, work in day in day out. It has been very interesting to see um, you know, where automation initiatives have, have found their place in, in these business continuity plans. Um, oftentimes, becoming more integral to the process, which is something certainly that uh, we, we've seen in trends year over year. Um, so perhaps in certain ways many companies better prepared to, to deal with something like this than they would have been five, certainly 10 years ago, which is uh, hope, hopefully lessening the burden on, on some of these organizations. It's probably a good transition then in, into the first uh, poll question of the day. Uh, Nick, you want to read through the options for the group? Yeah, sure, right. So a really simple question just to um, make sure uh, everyone is, is still here and we're awake and, and to encourage some interaction. So really we're asking, you know, how is everyone on the line today? What has been the impact uh, to date of COVID-19 at your organization? So we've got a single answer question here. 
you know, option number one, we're mostly okay so far. So, you know, we're working with home, uh, from home, but there's only minimal disruption to operations. Second option, number two, we've had some bumps working from home, but there has been some or some major disruption to operations. Uh, and third, uh, business as usual, fingers crossed, we're operating and transforming as, as normal. So, Ashley, uh, if we kick off the first poll, thank you very much. Uh, give folks uh, uh, a few moments to uh, to pick the best answer here, right? Seems seems quite simple. Um, I'm not sure actually if you can if you can uh, track uh, or see progress on the, on the back end there, but uh, feel free to uh, to close it um, uh, at, uh, at the time most most suitable. Um, really, just three options here: we're mostly okay, or we've had some bumps, or it's it's business as usual. I'm gonna close it in uh, three, two, one. Well, no surprise there, Ryan. Uh, it's great to see that um, majority response is we're mostly okay so far. Uh, everyone is disrupted, right? No, no surprise there. Um, and we were yep. just talking at the start there about about BCP and emergency planning and so on. And um, you know, uh, you look at these results. Uh, what, what do you what do you what do you think so far? What's been your impression? Yeah, I think it's pretty consistent with what we're seeing. Um, you know, this is something. Uh, that's impacting people far and wide. That, that is for sure. And many organizations um, have had to dig a little deeper and find a new way of, of handling certain processes that uh, were once sort of an afterthought of these organizations, which is uh, interesting in, enough in itself. But um, what has been encouraging, I think, in our experience, especially at, at Tungsten, is that, um, as I said, many of these organizations have equipped themselves with uh, certain tools and functionalities that have enabled the, the work from home uh, practices. And, and maybe more impressive is where they didn't have those functionalities and those tools or those features. Um, many organizations have started to lean towards the more creative side of, of simply getting the job done in, in any way any way necessary, um, which as you referenced earlier in the pharma or food manufacturing space is probably more uh, important now than it's, it's ever been, at least in the, the recent past. So um, very interesting stuff. And certainly, you know, as we look um, into some of the things we've learned, I think our experience has been aligned here, Nick, in our dealings with our, our customers and the relationships we have in the space. Um, almost every organization, I think, that, that we work with has leveraged their business continuity plan to some extent. Um, some organizations have leveraged it fully and um, gone above and beyond even what the, the BCP plan had um, prepared for at all, because as, as I said, this is something like we've never seen before. And, and certainly in the case, um, like many of the outsourcing centers in India, having full lockdowns across the country, um, something that, that just wasn't uh, typically a, a real thought for, for many of these organizations. Um, you touched on it earlier. We've seen working from home practices um, and, and some of the very basic impacts that has on, on our daily lives. I think you, you've all seen uh, some social media content around uh, kids walking into the room or dogs barking or mute buttons use, being used ineffectively. Um, but it certainly impacted us in, in a very simple way from a work from home perspective. And, and um, all three of us here running the webinar are certainly in that boat, so it's a new experience for us. Um, and then an, an interesting, interesting trend for us too as a, a business that, um, you know, at our very core manages a business to business transaction network. Um, we really see customers running the full uh, spread of, of impact here. We, we, in the food manufacturing, CPG, pharma industries have, have seen um, basically volumes as normal or, or even increased in certain cases because of the, the demand changes and shifts around the globe. Uh, we've also seen um, certain customers in certain spaces and verticals where their business has been unfortunately impacted tremendously. Um, and it really has for us come down customer by customer, process by process, uh, even region by region or country by country. Um, to understand what challenges they're going through and what they're doing to combat them. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Ryan. So, um, just quickly introduce this slide, right? So, um, 
I myself work from home most of the time, so the immediate impact on me of this situation has has been quite limited. Uh, although my kids and my wife are home, uh, and so we're just adjusting to that. But but really, as it says here, right, you know, where we had those existing plans, those that were most able to react with confidence uh, were the ones that that were able to you know utilize those existing plans, put them in place, and react. Um, you hear about some interesting responses. You know, do we have enough laptops? Can we go down to to, to the local um, white goods store and, and pick up some laptops or whatnot? Not in every case was that possible, right? Because everyone was thinking the same thing. I need some new screens. I need some laptops. You know, in the case you mentioned, uh, India, Ryan. You know, all of the BPO firms, uh, all of their staff needing to work from home. Basically, you couldn't get a laptop in in the whole of India for for love nor money, right? So uh, some of these things were just just forced upon us. Um, you're talking about the impact on, on remote working. So pretty much for, for most folks, that's that's how it is for the immediate future. Um, we ran a number of um, um, virtual discussions um, and some, some roundtables, some client discussions with, with other Hackett members uh, last week and the week before to get their feedback on how they were responding, how they were reacting. Some of them were saying actually, you know, volumes in terms of orders going out the door. Uh, or invoices being received, payments being made, are actually greatly reduced and 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 uh, and, uh, and scaled down. So that makes it a bit easier uh, on our plans, on our responses. We also heard that um, from a P2P perspective, we have taken a number of steps, right? So perhaps we've thought about uh, and put in place some temporary policies, or updated our procedures, and communicated these internally to stakeholders and also importantly to suppliers. So we heard from a number of members that they were perhaps relaxing their policies, uh, their P2P policies in certain ways to make sure that the core business was protected, so they were controlling expenditure, but also, um, you know, certain um, parts of the business needed to keep running, right? So they wanted to make sure that they were able to get the goods or services that they need, um, whether it was PPE um, or laptops or whatnot, so that they could continue operations. And that meant doing things like accelerating supplier onboarding, if they were thinking about uh, alternative or new suppliers, uh, promoting the use of, say, uh, alternative buying channels, so P cards, corporate credit cards. I saw yesterday the government here in the UK had actually raised the uh, the, the limit on their um, P cards for a single transaction up to £20,000, and the, and the maximum uh, over a month was £100,000. So for corporates as well as governments, they've been responding that way. Uh, the use of one-time vendors. Um, I think, Ryan, you mentioned this, promoting digital interaction. So shifting away from, from phone interactions, live phone interactions, to more electronic or, or email, right? If we're working from home, we need to make sure those communication channels stay open. But I've heard from some organizations that saying, look, we, we just prefer to receive electronic digital documents, or even actually, uh, we're no longer accepting paper, right? Our scanning team might be locked down. We, we can't use the, the tool anymore. So they're looking at, at, at workarounds for that, whether or not it's a file upload or just take a picture or whatnot. Something simple like uh, making sure that our workflow uh, delegations and those who are approved um, are up to date, right? If, if we're out sick or on leave, um, then we need to make sure that the workflow tool still supports a smooth process. Um, I've heard uh, firsthand about electronic payments from some folks, especially in uh, North America, Canada, or the US. They said, you know, some of our clients, we never expected they would ever move away from checks. You know what? They have uh, been, you know, been, been, um, been asking, you know, please, please move us to, to electronic straight away. And the last point here, I think, is really so, Nick, uh, quick question. There, you, you touched on some interesting trends, right? So, so there are um, you know, shifts very tangibly that we're seeing in this space. So, uh, as you deal with these interactions and, and you hear of these examples of long holdout suppliers, you know, moving away from check or, or moving to electronic transactions or electronic orders being delivered, all of those things. To what extent do you think this is a, a permanent shift in the space as opposed to just a business continuity plan or an emergency preparedness uh, action? Is it potentially something that's here to stay? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, I mean, no one knows exactly, you know, uh, what the future is going to look like, but um, uh, I think there's going to be an increased reluctance to handle physical cash, paper documents, even, you know, you probably think twice about uh, perhaps going down to your store and just getting getting a magazine or a newspaper. So digital might be here to stay. I mean, it depends on your thoughts, your view on 
what is the impact of of the virus uh you know approaches to to immunity and, and things like that but um uh, the immediate reaction has been certainly uh a movement away from from paper um and we could even think about um this as as a bump that we can take advantage of right from our, our digital projects or our transformation projects um, has this has you know it's a shame that we've needed perhaps an event like this to to make some of the shift happen but um, perhaps it's an opportunity that we can take advantage of um, so some good comes out of something terrible like like the current situation so my feeling is that once you've shifted to digital this is going to be permanent right um, it's not often that I hear from from customers or suppliers that you know, oh, we went digital, but you know what? We actually prefer paper. It, it tends to be a one-way, a one-way street. I don't know, Ryan, if you have a, a, a contrast view, something on the contrary there. No, I, I'd agree with you, right? And, and certainly, we are in the digital space uh, firmly planted, and, and we have our reasons for believing that that uh, true digital automation, true digitization, is the path forward. Um, this unfortunate uh, global pandemic is certainly bringing that to light in a form and fashion we probably never envisioned. Um, but it, it will be interesting because we have, to your point, we've seen, um, you know, customer mandates and we've seen pushes to electronic, probably unlike um, we've even ever seen before with urgency um, behind it that, that hasn't been seen. Certainly there are different drivers for that, uh, which we've been discussing, but it, it's, it's very interesting times, that's for sure. Just before we move on to onto the next polls, um, just um, just to emphasise the last bullet there on on the slide, right? I think this is quite key in this current emergency situation. There are unfortunately um, third party actors and so on that are really trying to take advantage of it. So increasing awareness and just taking care around fraud, phishing attacks, um, deception, and so on. So doing things like locking down your bank master. Uh, for any changes, it seems like um, 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 it's the the right thing to do right now, right? Uh, I'm already hearing stories about um, about situations of of invoice fraud and so on. Um, so you know, you think, well, in the current pandemic, why would anyone be asking to change their bank information? You know, so you might want to think about taking taking actions like that. Um, you know, reviewing who's got cards and and so on, and just and just tightening up in the places that need to be tightened up. Uh, while while protecting protecting the core business. All right. So you mentioned the next poll there. Uh, question two gets into specific uh, responses to COVID nineteen and supporting business operations. So the uh, the options below are, and you can select all that apply. We've made it easier example, balancing control, but increased approval limits for specific users, requirement to use PO, et cetera. We're tightening up. Um, example would be balancing control, but decreased approval limits, deactivating purchasing cards, canceling POs, challenging all spend, et cetera. Three, uh, paper invoices not preferred, promoting electronic over digital, as Nick mentioned a moment ago. Um, that would probably include uh, some softer messaging to, to your supply chain. And then the last one there, uh, paper invoices no longer accepted, scanning, lockdown, electronic, digital invoice uh, accepted only. And um, yeah, that, that would probably be a stronger message that, that would come along with a word like a mandate um, around electronic invoicing specifically. So Ashley, you'll open the poll there and, and we'll see some results. I'm really interested in in uh, in what the poll is going to show here, actually, Ryan. Um, you know, in the conversations I've had, I've uh, I've I've seen I've seen organisations making it easier. I've heard uh, a lot of others tightening up. Um, and you know, to the conversation we were just having around what's going to happen with with paper invoices, um, I'd be interested to see to see you know what percentage of the audience today have have driven that strong mandate. They've said, you know what? Yeah. Uh, we're we're this is perhaps a risk where we're we're no longer prepared to to accept. So really, really interested. Yeah, and I'm sure it's tied you know, directly to the efficacy of those BCP plans, right? Because we we in our experience have seen um, certain 
you know, offshore or outsourced uh, processes be more impacted or less impacted based on how strong the plan was. Uh, so I think your your kind of follow up decision is how how well is our plan working and and what decisions do we need to take to to offset the uh, negative impact of what is and is not working. Okay, well definitely some interesting results. I see um, uh, a majority, almost two thirds, saying definitely taking steps to to prefer more electronic or digital methods. I'm interested in um, there's a smaller number there. Okay, twenty thirteen percent. You know, have either made it easier or tightened up. Um, and there might be some opportunities there in terms of looking at your policy or taking some additional actions. But but also seven percent, right? Almost ten percent are saying, you know what, we we no longer accept paper. So that number might might actually be higher than than I was expecting. But it's it's great to see. So thank you for that. Um, shall we move on to onto the next polls? We've got some additional questions here um, in terms of the insights that I shared. You know, there were some other uh, actions that I see many, many uh, industry teams taking in terms of um, payments and whatnot. Um, so again, the poll number three here, you know, how have P2P and AP teams responded to support business operations? So again, multi-answer question, please select all that apply. You know, number one, we're trying hard to pay on time. It's tough and, and more effort has been needed uh, during, during the crisis. Uh, number two, we've taken steps to update, change our payment cycle. So looking at the timing, Perhaps we've moved it from daily to, to weekly, uh, as an example. Um, option three, uh, we've shortened our payment terms or taken steps to increase liquidity. So a special call out here to uh, micro or smaller vendors, uh, looking at, at offering you know, either early payments or, or discounts for early payment. And fourth, uh, we've actually taken steps to extend payment terms for specific agreements or specific vendors, but you know, we've taken, taken a, a agreements. So really interested to see what the results are here as well, right? Uh, additional efforts, yeah, it, pay on time. Yeah, it's, it's it's interesting for us as well. Yeah, I think we've again, depending on vertical and how um, how committed to digital these customers are, we've seen varying levels of impact and just getting the invoice to and approved for payment status. Um, but but this is an interesting follow up as well because we've also seen customers um, trying to drive out um, supply chain finance or dynamic discounting type offerings. Uh, to the whole of their supply chain, knowing that many suppliers are in a tough spot as well, just just like many of these AP organizations are. Um, so it was so very interested in the feedback here. I mean, something that I have seen ha has been uh, a lot of collaboration from industry companies, right? Um, in terms of extending terms, people have been very cognizant of uh, perhaps the reputational uh, damage that that might do. So there's been a lot of collaboration, a lot of support across uh, whole industry sectors, especially taking into account the smaller companies, which drive a lot of the a lot of the growth in the in the good times, and just recognition that they may need uh, additional care uh, and attention to to make sure they stay alive here. So you know, really really interested in the results as well. Okay, good, good. Wow. Okay. Trying hard to pay on time. Yeah. I mean, it's it's uh, it's going to be tough in the situation for sure, right? Um, to more than a half reporting that a quarter almost saying we've we've looked at uh, taking some steps around payment cycle timing. Good. Okay, so to almost ten percent, just a little under, saying actually we've we've uh, we've looked at payment terms uh, uh, to shorten things. Um, Fifteen percent saying we've actually extended payment terms. Okay, that's that's interesting in itself as well. It's uh, it's a number that's perhaps higher than I expected. A um, number of the the industry organisations I work with have. Uh, have definitely uh, taken steps around that eight percent number, but there there was no one that I'd spoken to that had looked at extending terms. I, I guess it's just a case by case situation, right? You need to do what it, what you need to do to stay alive. So, uh, yeah, interesting times. Uh, what are your thoughts, Ryan? Yeah, it is. I mean, uh, I think that that, um, that answer number one is, is really um, kind of first and foremost in everyone's mind. Uh, they're being asked. Um, in much more complex circumstances to do what they've always been asked to do and to make things work. Um, so it, it's really interesting um, in talking with each of these specific customers to, to understand what actions they're taking and, and what um, options they see as on the table to, to make uh, ends meet really for, for them and their supply chain. Good. So um, I, I think a healthy discussion and, and certainly some good feedback there. Nick, we, um, we started out this conversation, as I said, a few weeks, a few months ago, with a focus on an interesting trend 
um, that we were really looking across a decade or 10 year span, right? Um, where we're seeing these large organizations shift their focus from efficiencies and, and cost savings really to a more strategic value focused uh, theme. We just talked for the, the better part of the last 20 or 25 minutes about um, how that shift might have been accelerated a bit, especially as, as it pertains to digital initiatives and the value they drive. Um, but we should still dive into this trend on a more macro level because I think it is really important uh, for folks to understand what we're seeing across um, the space, really, and um, you know, keep it in contact with with the circumstances of today, but but also how they might fit into this this trend on a, a larger scale. Yes, absolutely. I mean, the, the typical organization that uh, that I work with at, at Hackett is, is a large industry organization or a large multinational. So, um, and, and this isn't um, our perspective or our opinion. It's based on, you know, the data that we've collected, the studies that we've run over time. And, and this is a specific study that we run every every two years. And, and exactly like you were saying, Ryan, I think there's some really interesting and exciting trends that we've seen, you know, from an initial focus you know, eight years ago around, you know, the use of centralization, shared services, just standardizing our process to more recently, um, much more focus around the, status, the satisfaction of, of stakeholders, uh, transforming digitally and, of course, driving more value from our process. And some of the question I usually get when I'm presenting this slide is, who's, who's setting these as, as the priorities, Nick? And uh, there's some extra questions that we asked, and it's actually... The finance leadership or the treasury leadership or um, the executive team they're saying you know we, we want more than a, than efficiency um, you know you need to think about satisfaction in the process and making it as easy as possible so there's a a lot of um, a lot of moving parts here some really interesting trends but um, let's move on to onto the next slide let's uh, let's blow up what we mean a little bit by by this idea of, of value, right? So at Hackett, we now start, start to talk about the three E's of, of digital value, so this modern concept. So uh, we've even updated uh, a view on what we mean by efficiency. So, you know, it's efficiency with speed or, or agility. Um, but, you know, when we talk about effectiveness from a P2P perspective, you know, what do we mean there? We're really talking about, you know, the steps that we can take to look to uh, maximize um, and deliver further business value. So from a P2P perspective, this might be the actions that we take in terms of protecting or enhancing working capital or supply risk or actions in terms of quality and compliance, even supporting growth in, in terms of the business. Um, and then from an experience point of view, right, this might be quite uh, quite novel for some folks on the, on the webcast today, but it's the idea that, you know, we're really looking to optimize the value of, of the relationships with stakeholders, right? There might be different stakeholders involved, whether or not it is uh, customers or stakeholders in the business or suppliers. Um, and we're just trying to make it as, as easy as possible for them um, to, to consume the process, to use the tools, even from a supplier perspective, uh, to be to be seen as that customer of choice. And, and there's another trend at play here, right? So we see that more than 50% of organizations are actually telling us, P2P organizations, are telling us that their priorities are focused more on the right-hand side of this diagram today, right? So it's, it's, it's not just effectiveness and experience. It's, you know what, uh, deliver those efficiency targets, but also make sure you deliver on effectiveness and experience, right? So this is a trend that we've seen, and for the first time, you know, less than 50% of organizations have just focused on, on uh, efficiency. Now, from my own perspective, um, you know, what's driving this trend? I think um, a lot of teams have um, achieved a lot of great success in a lot of their goals in terms of their efficiency objectives and their targets, but some are starting to hit the limits of what they've been able to achieve, right? They may already be down to, you know, one or two dollars in terms of pounds, dollars, or, or euros, and they're struggling to go any lower. Um, and from my perspective, I actually look at um, you know, delivering, being able to deliver on some of those experience benefits as, as an enabler um, to actually unlock further value um, in our transformation roadmaps. And uh, I'll talk a bit more in, in, in a bit more detail, especially the optimization stage. 
Um, but you know, in terms of driving this change, we're we're going to need a, a modern roadmap, a new roadmap to actually enable that. Yeah, well, Nick, I'm you know, I think what, what's really interesting that you call out there, and I, I think it, it needs um, even more focus, and we'll talk about it more in a second. But this idea that there are probably more stakeholders in the frame than ever before, and those stakeholders, as you said. Uh, could be internal, they could be external, they could be parts of the organization that, that were never really part of the conversation in the past. Um, but what's very interesting for us is as that experience uh, improves across this broader set of stakeholders, the value proposition becomes that much larger and the, the value focus that much louder in, in these organizations that are, that are really focused on the experience component. And that would mirror our experience um, almost exactly as it has been over the past, certainly the last year or two, we've seen that shift more and more loudly. Good, good. Yeah, I, I really see it as as an and discussion, right? It's not it's not an or, you, you need to be thinking about doing, doing it all and, and how we get after those potential uh, pots of value. You know, I've got what I, what I like to think as a, as a, a simple, modern updated roadmap right you know three steps foundation there's an optimization stage and then you know at the top of the picture there um, a third phase around delivering strategic value you know we're starting out making sure we've got that solid and robust foundation you know we need to automate our standard process make sure we've got a streamlined policy uh, run some initiatives to make sure that um, we're driving a focus around quality and compliance um, and then once we've built that foundation, we're into the optimization stage, right? And here it's a focus around optimizing and driving efficiency. So doing things like um, designing and, and rolling out our preferred channels for, for buying for invoicing and payments, uh, provide the support that our stakeholders need. Uh, and then we may go through a number of optimization initiatives, right? So through those efforts, we might identify additional uh, opportunities. We end up coming down to the foundation stage again, making any necessary changes and then coming up and working through uh, optimization again. Um, and then once we've pushed that as far as we can, um, we're moving on to strategic value, right? It doesn't necessarily need to be a, a linear approach. You know, it, um, we can start to change, chase some of those effectiveness and experience uh, benefits in, in that optimization stage, but certainly at that strategic value point, you know, that, that really needs to be much more of the focus, right? We should have driven as much as we can from a from a cost reduction from an efficiency um, perspective and, and, and funny you say there a linear approach right we find it's um almost cyclical in nature um some of the, the leading organizations we work with they'll go through that foundational stage which is to identify the process define the process automate that process to whatever extent possible and then there's certainly as you say the fine tuning or optimizing phase where you've deployed the solution or the strategy You've fine-tuned it. You've tried to make the most of what you can. And then what we're finding in many of these organizations is after they get to that point of optimization, the new digital or automated process uh, sheds light on new areas for improvement. So it's almost a, a secondary visit to the drawing board um, to drive that further effectiveness, certainly the experience. Um, but really, it, it's driven by some uncovering of, of things that might have been buried in, in the manual. Um, so that you may have a couple of iterations of this cycle you, you see here, and it, it's certainly a journey, and Tungsten talks about that a lot, um, but it is certainly a journey through these, these levels as, as you talk through them. Good, good. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Um, so let's, let's move on to the next slide and just look at uh, where we are in terms of um, progress, right? So for each of those three levels, we've looked uh, from a Hackett perspective at, at three key metrics to sort of track or illustrate how much success, how much progress we've been able to, to make against them. And we've got median uh, numbers here. So it's the midpoint of our, of our um, performance data based on 2019 numbers. And we'll go through this quite quickly because I want to make sure we have enough time to get to uh, uh, some of the later parts. But um, from my perspective, you know, there's, there's a lot of opportunity still here in, in the foundation, right? And uh, I've got this quote on the screen. You know, many teams are still operating twin tracks of, of legacy and, and the more modern digital processes. So you look at some of those benchmarks, you know, 36% of, of, um, of um, volumes, medium performance, you know, using electronic PO and distributing them to suppliers. Um, from an electronic uh, invoicing perspective, being able to digitalize and, and automate, you know, 30% using electronic invoice or, or um, 
and voiceless type type methods. Um, and from a policy or compliance perspective, how successful are we at uh, driving down invoice only spend? Right, so 27% of spend is, is still uh, you know without a, a purchase order, which is which is a great number, but uh, still still more to go. Right, so a lot of lot of opportunity here. I guess um, you know one of the key points is you know we need to move away from just thinking about a, a tactical approach. So you know let's do a bit of scanning or let's do an invoicing project and make sure we take a, a much more um, joined up approach. Right. So if our goal is really to get to 100% capture of spend and transactions, then we we need to take a, more of a multi pronged approach. Make sure we're able to maximise those digital elements but realize there's certain constraints on where we can operate. And then looking at our progress from an optimization point of view, uh, are more positive, right? The, the three KPIs that I picked here, again, similar median per performance numbers, you know, starting from the left there. How effective are we at guiding um, our stakeholders to use our preferred channel? So 69% in terms of guiding requisitioners uh, or shoppers, you know, effective or mostly effective. In terms of driving quality, uh, first pass match rates, so for, for PO invoices, about 81% uh, there. And I mentioned earlier on about, you know, experience. So something like enhancing supplier relationships, you know, the median organization is now 82% in terms of pay on term. So doing things like, um, again, the, the efficiency focus, but preferred channels, two-way matching, standardizing the payments process, um, you know, some, some good good opportunities, some good initiatives here. Perhaps uh, we just move on to onto the challenges there, uh, Ryan. Super, thank you. Um, so we've made some good progress, uh, but it hasn't been easy, right? And uh, I actually presented this slide uh, and did a quick poll with uh, with um, the Tungsten audience at their recent um, Insights conference. And I put the slide up and I asked um, the folks in the room, you know, uh, please put your hands up if you recognize these challenges. and you know, there's a rough number, about three quarters of the audience were saying, uh, you know, they, they face these these challenges, which I think is is really interesting. So, you know, quickly go through them, right? In terms of digital enablement, it can be difficult to to achieve these high performance, these Hackett benchmark numbers across all markets, right? So, you know, we do see um, some parts of the world being more challenging than, than the others. So like Eastern Europe and, and parts of, of Asia is, is a couple of examples. Um, moving to the, the green one in terms of visibility of information, you know, you know, if we want the focus to be more around uh, addressing uh, the root causes, the reasons for the blockages, the delays in our processes, you know, we need an, an analytics tool or some visibility in, in terms of being able to identify that so we can take an action on it. Um, and something that I've seen some of the, the true leaders, you know, they have another struggle is um, when you're able to get to 90% performance in a certain metric, how do you move the dial on the last 10%. So again, you know, having that insight, that visibility, that analytics platform is quite is quite key. Also a challenge in terms of master data, either onboarding suppliers or uh, maintaining the quality of the data or the control of the data. I mentioned before a bit around um, tightening up control around the bank account master, but, you know, verifying suppliers with um, um, vendor callbacks and so on is a, is a challenge I commonly hear about as well. Another one, uh, bottom left, is just timely execution, whether or not it is getting that GR in or whatnot, or um, getting the approval for that purchase order. Challenges, challenges there. Um, minimizing errors in the process, uh, payment fraud, uh, duplicate payments, you know, being able to move to a more um, proactive approach rather than responding reactively. And this last one around improving overall stakeholder satisfaction, also, also a challenge there as well. Yeah, I think Nick, from from our perspective at Tungsten, and you you summarized it well uh, as far as the feedback from the audience at our user event. Um, I, I think it's interesting, really, because we no longer simply focus on digitizing the invoice. That that is kind of a conversation of the past. It's really these parallel tracks about driving world class levels of adoption from from a digitization and a true e invoicing perspective. Um, but almost every conversation we have on, on a daily basis is centered around the value of the transaction now, right? How can we drive um, highest first pass yield or straight through processing metrics? How can we make sure that we drive exceptions through the floor as a result? Um, how can we ensure that the data we're driving into our organization is, is not only timely and accurate, but then potentially leveraged in other areas of the business from a, a data visualization or an analytics standpoint? 
Um, and all of these challenges are, are at the forefront of our daily interactions with, with customers really driving these electronic initiatives. Um, and it just goes to show how, how credible the information is here and how accurate the feedback is you've been gathering over the years. That's great. That's great. Thanks. Thanks, Ryan. Um, we're, we're not operating this alone, right? Thankfully, uh, there's uh, some new trends, some new opportunities that is going to make our, our role as, as AP leaders or P2P leaders a bit a bit easier in the future. So I think um, these four trends here in terms of technology, service design, talent and value, I think they'll really help us solve some of the, the problems that we're facing today or help us accelerate uh, uh, to, you know, our projects to be able to, to fully realize the, the, the the expectations that we have. So if I start at the top there in terms of technology, right? So, you know, digital transformation has been a bit of a buzzword for the last few years. Uh, but, you know, there's new and helpful technology coming out, you know, RPA and, and AI and machine learning, the advanced analytics that we're just talking about, new visualization tools, uh, APIs for data flows, new mobility tools, if it's Fiori apps or something else, new digital payment methods uh, on our phones or whatnot. You know, it really creates the opportunity uh, to help us realize and, and move towards much more of the promised automation goals. So, you know, we can think about actually being able to automate 98% of our spend or transactions, um, being able to digitalize um, the, the relationships and the, and the collaboration, the conversations from a buyer through to a supplier. Um, you know, the opportunity to capture all spend uh, across all orders, all, all invoices using using the tools um, is, a, is, a, is a real opportunity. You know, from a service perspective as well, uh, you know, we've been focused for, for quite some time around building out and, and, uh, and designing these end-to-end -end, uh, processes. Um, but, you know, new trends here in terms of bringing in the, the stakeholder experience. So a leader like Mondelez is one example has, has truly uh, thought about this different and, and designing, you know, end-to-end -end services stretching from that buyer to supplier. So instead of having a, a P2P process owner, they now have like an, an invoice payment experience leader. So that's an interesting trend. Uh, another trend is, you know, it's no longer just a, a one-size-fits-all approach. We're actually thinking about who are, the, who are our consumers, who are the stakeholders that need to be involved here, what are their characteristics, what are their persona types, and we design certain channels uh, that's going to best fit their needs, right? So uh, we realize certain um, stakeholders, certain suppliers in certain parts of the world, you know, they're not going to move away from uh, paper, or maybe with COVID they will. Uh, you know, some love their PDFs, their emails, some want the PO flip or whatnot. But we offer up and design services with our, our stakeholders in mind, and that hopefully gives us the best chance of, of success there. Um, we also start to see a trend towards having operations control towers. So, you know, moving beyond some of the core in terms of AP and what we've been doing for years and years, we've now got an analytics tool that gives us visibility into the transactions flowing through the systems. We're then able to actually identify and resolve blockages or, or holdups in our process to, to really make it run uh, as smooth as possible. And this means certain changes in terms of talent. Certainly roles across the team have, have, have changed. New roles have appeared, you know, as our focus has shifted from uh, just executing and, and keying in or processing invoices to instead much more focus around um, actually uh, resolving and eliminating the, the root cause for, for issues. Um, we want to be seen uh, as more as um, uh, focusing on the exceptions or the deviations, and then we need uh, new subject matter experts in terms, of, in terms of some of these digital digital tools. And from a value perspective, right, this has been a theme of this entire webcast, right? More value add being being demanded. So we start to see new KPIs being the focus. You know, no longer just um, cost to cost to serve or, or productivity, but you know, speed or cycle times or pay to terms and then uh, new capabilities new new skills being added uh, you know help us to control um, the tail end of suppliers whatnot or help us manage supply you know from from tightening up on on the vendor vendor master or whatnot uh, or help us in terms of compliance perspective so you know a number one key priority for the finance function to 2020 uh, obviously, uh, earlier in the year was actually around master data, so analytics, reporting, and so on. So P2P has got a key role to play in terms of, you know, master data stewardship and, and supporting um, that strategic asset and so on. 
Okay, um, I think Ryan, just looking at time, yeah, that's what I was thinking as well. Just move on to this third scorecard, right? So this is the scorecard around uh, progress in terms of driving strategic value, and, and similar to the other ones, I, I picked three key metrics here to really look at um, how well we're, we're progressing. So starting at the top left there, you know, how well are we doing in terms of enhancing that stakeholder experience, right? So 28% saying when they, so it's 28% of organisations saying. You know, when they uh, poll their internal stakeholders, what are their thoughts, views on the P2P process? So you've got you know, 28% of teams saying we're, we're satisfied. No one's saying they're, they're very satisfied, but don't please don't use this as an excuse to just leave it uh, alone and do nothing, right? The leaders here are, are polling at double that level, right? And, and as I said earlier, in terms of um, um, addressing some of the challenges and the blockages that we face, I think working on the, the stakeholder experience is key to, to moving things on. Um, you know, looking at the, the middle metric there in, in, in the top panel, uh, and, and this topic, you know, benefiting the financial supply chain, uh, liquidity or discounts or supporting smaller suppliers, I think this is probably um, a more relevant topic uh, in, in the current pandemic environment. But you can see here, of those who have these financial supply chain tools in place, only two thirds have a discount strategy. So there's, there's an opportunity there to do more in terms of thinking about which suppliers to target. Um, in terms of um, payment terms, early payment discounts, and and, and financing, and so on. Um, and the top right, in terms of the opportunity around exploring emerging technologies, so you can see here, 24% of organisations are piloting or using robotics today uh, in the finance function. So there's 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 more that we can do there in terms of enhancing that experience and and being able to capture further um, effectiveness benefits. But again. Under, under technologies, right? We, we do need a digital strategy there. So that brings us on. Poll number four, uh, how do stakeholders at your organization rate the P2P or AP experience today? So this is a single choice answer. I'm just ask you to please select the, the most relevant one. So option number one, stakeholders are, we think, you know, stakeholders are dissatisfied, they're very dissatisfied. Stakeholders are, are neutral, option two. Uh, moving on, you know, option three, stakeholders are satisfied or very satisfied, or actually option four, haven't thought about it or, or don't know. Um, you know I'm, I'm really interested to, to see the answers here. Uh, Ryan, you, you probably are as well. I, I'm sure there's a, a number of folks, option four, haven't thought about it, but the split, I think this will be really interesting. Agreed. Yeah, nice honest look at uh, respective organizations here, right, to, to see where they sit. and. and to your point on the previous slide, we only saw in the you know, mid to high 20% saying that their stakeholders were satisfied or very satisfied. So uh, certainly I don't think people will be alone if they say that they're neutral or, or dissatisfied here, or even that they haven't thought about it yet. So let's go ahead and, and close the poll and we can bring up the results and see how well we're doing. Okay. so. 50% saying satisfied or very satisfied. Well, I'm really, really encouraged by uh, by the audience that we've brought to the, the Tungsten uh, webcast today. This is this is fantastic. Uh, feel free to let us know in in the columns and sorry in the in the chat or the Q and A or later on what it is that you're doing that uh, that's that's driving these these results. I mean, 15% uh, saying dissatisfied, very dissatisfied. Almost 10% haven't haven't thought about it. But uh, I, I'm really really uh, happy to see those results. That's that's great, Ryan. So. Yeah, absolutely. Sort of validates the trend in a way, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Maybe it's just the Hackett, uh, Hackett clients that, uh, that rate themselves yeah, right. a, bit, uh, a bit tighter, right? Exactly. A bit, a bit more brutal. Let's move on, on to the next slide. It, it might be one of the case study examples. Yeah, so just want to quickly go through this and um, and then we can we can move on to, to the Q&A. So we're pretty close to, to the end and do want to give some time for, for folks to, to ask any questions or whatnot. But um, you know, we've just been talking about the experience. So I've got this example here from a, a, a large multinational uh, pharma life sciences company. Uh, and this is their metro or their tube map um, for happy and unhappy journeys for, for source to pay or, or, or purchase to pay. Right? And it looks complicated, but um, really the message here is, you know, buying goods or services uh, uh, was uh, was a key initiative, right, uh, among their operations processes. So, you know, they spent a lot of time mapping out the, the happy and the unhappy journey. So what do I mean by that, the happy journey? Well, you know, within P2P, we spend a lot of time thinking about how do we enable uh, stakeholders in the business to, to buy 
uh, from a pre-approved or preferred supplier using self-service content, uh, raise a PO, uh, give us an electronic invoice, and, and we'll pay you electronically, right? We spend a lot of time focusing on that. But re and the reality is, when we when you hold your stakeholders and you ask them, what are the reasons why why you know you provide the feedback like you do, or you say that the process is challenging, or you don't really understand it, or why does it take so long? It's a lot of the other use cases, a lot of these unhappy journeys that are driving the, the dissatisfaction. So, you know, we I'd encourage you to also map out and think about these sorts of business situations and think about how you solve them in, in terms of um, uh, that, that customer uh, orientation and the service mapping. So, you know, a real business reason for why I need to buy that product or that service from that unapproved supplier, that non-preferred supplier. You know, there's no content in the system or uh, there is a real reason, a business reason why I couldn't raise a purchase order or whatnot. So just, just encourage you to think that through. Um, or, you know, what are the real reasons driving? I, I urgently need to, to pay that supplier and so on. Uh, so that's that's one of the case studies. I've got a second case study here. Uh, on the next slide from uh, from a large uh, logistics company and they, they do a lot of um, uh, B2C work but um, you know their approach to, to being customer centric was to think about all the different stakeholders that they interact around the world and all the different countries and, and the different ways that they wanted to um, pay to consume their product uh, and so their approach was yeah we're going to stand up a single payment gateway and it's going to offer a, a single uh, look and feel and we're going to enable within the technology you to pay by all these different ways, right? So this is actually uh, an AR example, but uh, I wanted to put that up as well. But yeah, I, I saw someone sneak ahead to the Q&A, so let's go there. Uh, we've managed to get through the materials. We've got five minutes to spare, so let's open up uh, open up for any any questions. Thanks, Nick and Ryan. Um, we do have a few questions before we close out the session for today. Um, what impact do you? What impact or impacts uh, do you see coming out of the global pandemic? Do you think things will return to normal? Hmm. Big question there, Nick. You want to you want to take a stab first? <laughs> That's very very kind. Thanks thanks, Ryan. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, yeah yeah. Um, what, what's the likely outcomes? I mean, I think it, it, it makes sense to think about it in terms of a number of, of different scenarios. I think we're finding out today that it's that it's impacting, you know, our way of working in our daily life uh, quite quite significantly. Right? It, yeah, we might be out of this uh, in the next month, or it might stretch into 2021. I, I do see different different scenarios and, and people forecasting different outcomes. I think, you know, we need to think about some things like uh, how successful we are in in terms of um, controlling infections through the lockouts. I think we need to think about things like uh, immunity and, and uh, how long does it last for. Uh, we also need to think about uh, balancing the, uh, the protection of uh, people's health, which is really important about also um, the economy and, and people's uh, uh, livelihoods, uh, their companies, their, their, their employments and so on. And uh, I'm encouraged uh, by by what I see happening um, in in Italy, uh, in parts of Europe like um, like Austria and Germany. They're already um, thinking about exit plans for how we can um, uh, get back to some of our more normal ways of working. But um, it might be that work from home becomes uh, and flexible working becomes more open to uh, more parts of of our teams. Uh, you know, we were talking about digitalization and getting rid of paper. You know, the shift of cashless society, right? If we're taking steps there, uh, that might be um, a trend that we that we don't walk back on. Um, I also don't think the impact across the economy will be equal as well. So, uh, unfortunately, some some verticals like um, airlines and travel and hospitality, I think some of the impacts there is going to be really quite significant. Um, but um, you know, as as we started off, like uh, the food production and, and logistics, and and like even Amazon and Alibaba. I, I remember reading just a couple of weeks ago that uh, Alibaba was one of the success stories that came out of the 2006 uh, SARS uh, pandemic in in Asia, right? So, without a doubt, online retail, online e-commerce will be will be a significant a significant winner. Uh, it's likely to be at some cost to the retail sector. I don't know, Ryan. What are your thoughts? Yeah, just I think quickly, I think you're spot on. Um, your perspective has changed and 
perspective must change going forward. I think this has kind of set a new bar for for what uh, preparedness and business continuity plans need need to be um, set up to accommodate. And um, certainly, I, I think this is something that is uh, now part of the new narrative. And organizations, just like individuals themselves, will, will take a, a new lens on things going forward. So I, I think while this uh, this crisis, as it were, probably passes behind us in a matter of time, I think some of the learnings stick with us well beyond uh, this current situation we're dealing with. Fabulous. Um, I will move on to um, the next question. I think we'll we'll be able to take this one just before we end things today. Um, you mentioned vendor master data in one of the earlier slides. Uh, what actions are you seeing um, on this front? Yeah, so just very quickly from a Tungsten standpoint, um, you know, we, we talked about the foundational element and we specifically in our market strategy, you see these foundational um, pieces to automation and uh, process robustness and really the strategic value initiatives that, that we've been talking about for the, the last hour. Um, I think Vendor Master is certainly one of the key pieces to that. Um, we, we all understand the the impact far and wide across the organization it can have. And in my experience, it's been sort of a um, underloved part of many organizations. And, and that has um, manifested itself in, in a number of ways specific to Tungsten's e-invoicing initiatives, right? If we don't have the proper vendor information or can't tie POs to the correct vendors or, or have the right contact details, all of those things impact our ability to, to drive successful initiatives. Um, and we specifically are, are working with um, our own product organization and partners alike to uh, to drive some more value-oriented solutions to our customers because we know it's a foundational element of all of our joint successes. Nick, I, I don't know how you feel on, on that front. Yeah, I think um, Vendor Master um, and, and Master Data generally, it's a, it's a massive opportunity. You know, one of the the upsides could be, you know, if, we, if we've got some spare time, um, because you know volumes processing volumes are down or some other projects have been stopped you know some of the housekeeping and some of the stewardship activities that uh, that we never had time to do in master data can we use now as an opportunity to actually you know get control clean up some of that some of that data and and use that as a step forward that uh, that will set us set us up in a nice place for later in the year or early 2021 when when things can get back to a bit more normal um but uh, there's there's a lot of stuff, a lot of opportunities we can do uh, on on master data, and it is a really really important topic that you know what we've we've never really had the time to to get around to, right? So can we put those those control and, and stewardship uh, procedures in place uh, to to benefit and leverage later on? That that would be one of my one of my guides or one of my suggestions. Thanks, Nick, um, and thanks, Ryan, and everyone for um, joining us today and staying on the two minutes over. I know we're all very, very busy people. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning of the call, we will be sharing the recording of the session along with the slides um, and a report um, that will be given to this audience only. So um, look out for that email uh, from myself, Ashley Infantino, coming to you shortly. Uh, thank you so much. Um, hope you have a great day, great rest of your day and evening, um, and we hope to see you online again soon. Thank you.